Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Yay. Yay. Doing a little rad pack action today, you know, it's after five. Mm. We have a power pack show for you on this gorgeous Sunday afternoon here in our secret location in Brooklyn. You guys ready? Um, we also have very special almond and oat jam cookies that I made and I brought. You'll get to try them. It goes good with that thing that you're eating there, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good follow-up. So, without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our very first act this evening. Oh my God, it's so bright, I can't even read my card. <laughs> All right, Miss Shirley Nome is here today, you guys. Shirley is a musical comedian songwriter from Vancouver, British Columbia. Not Washington, which I just found out there's a Vancouver there as well. With her guitar, her sassy mouth, and original songs about embarrassing, profound, and hilarious moments. She's been called an angel, dry humping a cloud. <laughs> she was People's <laughs> Champ of Comedy in 2012, and you may have seen her at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival or this year's Montreal Fringe Festival or the World Pride. We welcome this simply brilliant Chanteuse Provocatrice. Try to say that real fast three times. Hell, try to say that one time. I had to practice that word a couple times. So, Miss Shirley Nome, please take it away. Yeah. Why, thank you so much, Stephanie. How's everybody doing? Yeah. 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 So, uh, I'm a dirty country singer. That's what I do. Yes. Uh, I just want to point that out to the people who have a child in the back of the restaurant. I'm about to sing some, some pretty big swears. Just so you know. Earmuffs. Just so you know. Ear if you want to earmuff them for the next 15 minutes, might be better experience. But it's up to you. I don't really give a fuck, to be honest, so. <laughs> also, I want to point out that all of the chandeliers on the walls totally look like rainbow penises. <laughs> You people at home, you can't see this, but go to my Instagram, I took a picture. <laughs> so, you can see these magical rainbow penises. Okay. Well, let's get to it, shall we? Woo! Monday morning, the alarm went off. My bed was so cozy and my sheets so soft. I looked at the clock and I let out a moan. But breakfast wasn't going to cook on its own. Well, there's something about the morning with the sun so bright. How can it be wrong when it feels so right? No, I knew I'd go hungry if I took too long. I turned off the alarm and I turned me on. Yeah. I chose masturbation over breakfast. <laughs> what a tasty treat that I did not eat. I like my old. Baking from my head to my feet Ooh. Well, I got nothing on but the radio And time seems to go oh, so very slow With a flick of my wrist, I was in the midst Of a tidal wave of pleasure I could not resist Well, I sighed and I giggled and I checked the clock And saw that I spent too much time thinking about big heart rainbow so I jumped out of bed, my tummy said, God damn, but it was drowned out by the thank you of my happy little clam. Cause I chose masturbation over breakfast. Who needs food when you're in the mood? It wakes me up better than a cup of coffee. What a positive attitude. I give my pearl a word. I touch myself, leave the granola on the shelf, go between my legs, forget the eggs, I'll self-seduce and skip past the juice, spend some time with me instead of coffee and tea. Oh, my legs will shake, but I don't need a pancake. Give the two-finger salute instead of chopping up some fruit because it's me I love the most. I won't have any toast. Day is done. And what a day! 
was such a lovely morning, everything just went my way. Now morning stimulation is a habit I might keep. But I might wake up just to get to sleep. To sleep, whack off and go to sleep. Good night, I'm spit. Doody doo doo. -doo. Okay, <laughs> that's a true story. Um, little story about that. Uh, now my job is to travel around singing uh, about dicks and stuff. I don't have to wake up early anymore, which is great. Um, and that's nice too, because I am from Vancouver, and in Vancouver you smoke a lot of weed. That's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of it there. I actually started eating brownies instead so I could save my voice. But when I was experimenting with that, I ate like three pop brownies at once. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like, no, it was a terrible idea. It was, I couldn't, I couldn't function at all. Um, and I thought to get out of my head, which was getting very paranoid and a little too thinky, I thought I would have sex. <laughs> but that was not the right idea. Because when you start overthinking things in bed, it can get really weird really quickly. Even the most innocent and well-meaningful things, you know? So this song is called, Not For Me, I Guess. You hold me in your arms, you look at me and say, You're my old lady, my sexy mom, I want to be with you every day. I try to find that sweet, but it's like you just dropped a bomb. Cause you said I was attractive, but you also said that I was your mom. And then you said, who's your daddy? Didn't quite turn me on. So I said he's the man who lives in a house with the woman that is my mom. You looked at me confused I must have looked it too But I don't want to picture my dad's face When I'm having sex with you <laughs> Maybe it's just me But I'm not turned on sexually Or maybe I'm hung But calling me your mama It seems kind of fucked up And I don't want to call you daddy When you're getting me undressed Parent fucking well, it's really not for me, I guess. But everyone's a little bit different. I'm not here to judge. You look at me and you smile. You say, I didn't mean it that way. You say, baby, baby, pretty baby. That's just something that I like to say. You just called me baby. Yes, you did, don't lie. Cause I'm the woman you have sex with and you called me an attractive child. Maybe I'm just stoned and I'm thinking far too much, but why do we call each other infants when we're sexually active adults? Maybe it's just me. I'm not turned on sexually. Cause don't you think it would be sick if I called you a toddler while I sucked your dick? <laughs> that one's for the table in the back. <laughs> so I'm not gonna call you baby when you're playing with my breasts. The baby raping that you suggest, well, it's really not for me, I guess. Then you say to me, I wanna do it doggy style. Oh, you say to me, right in your pussy. <laughs> Why would you pretend to be a dog and then have sex with my cat? Please don't have sex with my cat. I don't think she'd like that. Maybe it's just me. But once you see it, you can't unsee Maybe I'm hung up. Are people just so fucked up? We gotta find a way around this. Just do the things we both like to do. 
So let's stick to the normal stuff. Lie down. I'm going to pee on you. Yeah, yeah. That's also a true story. <laughs> I, uh, I like to write from personal experience, but sometimes I have to rely very heavily on the things that my friends tell me in confidence. <laughs> So you get to guess which ones are about me, which ones are about other people. All right, here's a song for everyone that's eating food right now. <laughs> I come home oh so tired, I stumble through the door. The work day's done, it wasn't fun, I'm cranky and I'm sore. Oh, where shall I sit, a bed, couch, or recliner? No, I think I know the best place. Your face with my vagina. It's the very best thing after a long working day. Well, I'd ask you how your day was too, but I wouldn't hear what you say. Cause currently you're nestled deep inside my Oh, you know just how to let me have what every woman should. Well, I think mustaches are well paired with badges. Would you agree? And don't you think it's best when such a combo's firmly pressed? I climb on board, I take control. It's loving real close up. Well, it also works quite well if I just want you to shut up. Eight hours at the job, I'm running around all day. But don't worry, I will freshen up before I take my place. But once I clean the greasy engine underneath my hood, I know that you what every woman should Well, I've never met the man Who shook his head and said no thanks When I flip one leg over him And scoot up from his flanks And if he wasn't into eating muff It wouldn't be no thing I just see what would happen when I stop sucking on his wing. So ladies, I invite you, if it's not something you know, take a seat, yeah, grab your meat like a queen upon her throne. Well, I think it will go over well. I think he'll say all right, and I hope that you ladies to try this move tonight. Enjoy your dinner. Yeah. I like playing out with a dinner hour, it's good. Okay, I'm just gonna do one more for the end of this first set that I'm doing. Hello, internet. Are you going between me and pornography right now? I bet you are. <laughs> tabs, you gotta use your tabs. This is a song about partying with burlesque girls, which ends up <laughs> pretty messy a lot of the time. <laughs> yes, you guys know. It's called the Glitter Song. I'm a devastating diva with perfect pitch. I'm a bona fide busted bucks a badass bitch. But I drink too much, I make poor life choices. I woke up in a ditch. Just me and my bike piled up in a heap Guess I didn't take a cab cause I'm too cheap That's the best I can guess cause my memory's a mess At least I'm still wearing my dress But that's when it hit me in the morning light Under my clothes something wasn't right I took a peek underneath, what did I find? 
Mystery glitter where the sun don't shine Whose glitter, glitter is this? All over my clitoris I've had a shower 25 times And I can't get the glitter off this bowl of mine Whose glitter, whose glitter, whose glitter is this? All over Pop hit, by the way. <laughs> this is what gets me on the charts with Beyonce. Glitter when I sneeze, glitter when I cough. It's been a couple of weeks and I still can't get it off. I know what they say now, I know what they shout. Glitter is like herpes and I am breaking out. Glitter in my panties, glitter in my shoe. When I took a dump, there was glitter in my poo. <laughs> <laughs> but when I saw my reflection, I looked so good, like a diamond in the rough, with all these sparkles on my muff. Sure, it's itchy, and it's scratchy, and it burns down below, but the glitter in my soul is like the glitter on Go for another ride. <laughs> Shine bright like vagina. Shine bright like vagina. Shine bright like vagina. Beautiful diamonds between our thighs. Shine bright like vagina. Shine bright like vagina. Shine bright like vagina. Shine bright like vagina. I hope everything tastes good. So come on, let's give it up. That was really awesome. <laughs> Why, thank you. That was really thank amazing. you, people of Cavcast. I really want to find a unicorn now. That kind of got me in the <laughs> You can always find a man that will dress up as one. That's true. I never thought of that. That's the, I guess that's the easier option here. <laughs> <laughs> so you are from... What, what? Yes, my mic is on. Can you not hear me? My mic feels That's like it's on. That's never a problem for me, ever. I can hear you through the variety of things. Can you hear me? Yeah. I am sitting right next to you, but I'm pretty sure I can hear you not next to me as well. Yes. Okay. What, 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 what? Hmm? Yeah. Should you just sit on my lap? <laughs> Should we just do it like so, this? So, what do you want to know? Is that better? You can hear me, you can see me. All right, this is awesome. So now we're gonna get really close. I'm gonna learn a lot about you. I think I got glitter there now. Um, so you are from Vancouver, BC, a place I've never been but really wanna go. Cool. And what is, so how, growing up there, mm -hmm. is it a big music town? Like, how did you get into music? Into music specifically? Um, gosh, that's a very good question. I wasn't so much uh, Vancouver, I think I always loved music ever since I was a wee one. My parents played a lot of music when okay. I was growing up. And uh, I used to run around the forest singing at the top of my lungs, you know? More nice. of like a rural kind of thing. Uh, so when I moved to Vancouver, the music scene was kind of, they were starting to shut down a lot of venues there and it's been really difficult in Vancouver to keep things going, but there's enough of a community. And it's not so much music as it was burlesque that actually got me a place to perform because the burlesque people, when they found out about what I was doing, they wanted to book me for burlesque shows because it fit the mandate, so to speak. So um, that was, and uh, the burlesque scene there is huge, so. Is it really? Yes, it is. I did not know that. Yeah, it's really big. The burlesque scene in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's many, awesome. many talented people in that. So, and you, your songs are hilarious. Oh, thanks. So is there a lot of, because um, I know comedy music 
is become, it's like on the rise here and it's getting more popular. Cool. The comedy Music Festival, that's been going on the last couple of years. Right, right. Um, what, what made you fuse those together? Was it just something, I mean, was somebody doing it there that inspired you, somebody that you heard? Oh, I have, I've always loved musical comedy. Um, like, you know. Uh, you were talking about Weird Al before. Yeah, I loved Weird Al when I was a kid. Um, you know, and he does parody songs, but he also does great original songs as well, which I loved as a kid. And, like, there was also The Arrogant Worms, Corky and the Juice Pigs, uh, Three Dead Trolls and a Baggy. These are all Canadian okay. uh, musical comedy groups that I kind of heard about uh, when, when the internet got invented. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Let's go, go internet. Yeah, so. Um, there was all that stuff, but I never really chose to write musical comedy, but when I learned like three chords, it just sort of came out that way, and, uh, and people were very encouraging about it, so I kept doing it. Nice. Mm. So you are traveling right now. Yes, I am. Here in New York City. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We just want to throw out there that for you people watching, in tonight, uh, watching right now, if you're in Manhattan tonight, she is playing at the Kitty... Wait, what was Kitty Nights. Kitty Nights mm -hmm. at the M Bar. Mm -hmm. In at, Midtown. At 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock tonight. Yep. So from here to there, it's a busy day for our girls. <laughs> so, I like to be on the move. I like to be on the move. You're oh, yeah. in the right city for that. <laughs> yeah, I love it here. <laughs> we come back anytime. Okay. So we got. I have some questions for you. Some, they're really, really hard. You couldn't study for them. <gasps> I know. Oh my gosh. I hope you're ready. I was bone ready. All right, so All right. pick a number, 1 through 18. 8. Number eight. Oh, man. One on the back of the car. All right. <laughs> what is the thing that takes up most of your time outside of creative work that is required to make it happen? Masturbating. I like that answer. Actually, going back to your first <laughs> song, it really is a better way to save calories because you're, like, burning them instead of eating them. It's so true. I never thought of it. Why doesn't Weight Watchers put that in their little thing? I, I could be the next spokesperson. You should. Except I'm only going to get fatter, so it's not going to work. <laughs> Especially eating in this town. Oh, my God. There's a lot of good food here. Did you get good big portions here? I'm ready to get fat. I'm happy to do it. Do it, girl. Yeah. You're in America. I mean, I think that's kind of what you're supposed <laughs> yeah. to do here. Come to America. Get fat. Die. All right. I'm doing hey, it. <laughs> don't knock it. We are. Oh, no. I'm, I'm, this is a celebration. Right. Yeah. We are the number one exporter in the world of fast food. Thank you very much. Right here. Rah, rah, rah. I know. That's horrible, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Pick another number. Okay. I choose 16. All right. How do you keep focused on a goal? How do I keep focused on a goal? Um, I reward myself with the things I'm addicted to. Would you like to go into detail on some of those things? Yes, I can do that. So, you know, if I have a certain amount of music that I have to work on in a day, or if I have to do like the boring stuff, which is like, like the uh, booking media. and the social media and the publicity stuff, I'm like, I give myself like, a, you need to send out this many things or you need to work on this many songs. And then you can have a shot of whiskey. <laughs> oh, I was thinking shoes. I was like, wow, I gotta get another closet. <laughs> but I like that. That is good, right? Like you always have to reward yourself. That yes. makes all the work that you, you know, there's yeah. something at the end. Yeah, treat yourself if it's hard. And a lot of the times I just get inspired to do a lot of my gold stuff anyway. I'm so happy to be doing this that I just do it. Yeah. But then for the stuff where I'm like, because oh, everyone has down days even when they're living their, their total dream that like gets still like, oh. Can't I just stay in bed right. today? But, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I think every artist here can relate to that. Yeah. Um, so who are some of your other musical, like, or comedian, like, comedy inspirations? Um, my comedy inspirations. Well, I've always loved Flight of the Concords. They're a, they're a big one for me. Um, and also Sarah Silverman. I really enjoy. I grew up listening to George Carlin and oh, uh, yeah, and a lot of uh, Adam Sandler as well. My parents didn't really uh, censor me from anything, if you haven't noticed. <laughs> so I got to listen to some really awesome stuff. Lenny Bruce. I got to hear Lenny Bruce when I was younger as a kid? too. Yeah. Really? Yeah. But I was like, here, I want to show you the F words, not just on TV. <laughs> they must do that in Canada because there's no, they don't do that here. Hmm? Yeah. So you guys are so far ahead of us. Our friendly neighbors to the north. Fuck. <laughs> eh? Eh? Fuck, eh? <laughs> yeah, eh? All Should right. be the name of my next tour. <laughs> Fuck, eh? I love it. Um, so I have one more. Okay. This is a different set of questions. Ooh. That I wrote personally. So pick a number, one through nine. This is so exciting. I choose six. If you could build your dream sandwich, <laughs> the, I mean, I'm talking like the ultimate sandwich. Oh, my God. What would, what would be on it? 
Dream Sandwich, Come Rescue Me. Uh, that's what it would be called. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and uh, it would, okay, well, let's see. Oh God, this is, this is a, like I'm getting aroused to just thinking about rubbing my leg really intensely. I would say the meat would be prosciutto. Okay. And I think it would be like a, a boccaccini cheese with some basil, we'd do that. Some tomatoes, some Dijon, throw that in there. Uh, maybe some peanut butter just to get weird. I'd get stoned before I ate the sandwich too. So, so everything would just be yeah. There. Crunched up potato chips. Yeah. I put that in there. Yeah, and it would be on sourdough bread, and it would be served by a hot naked man. Who who has a nice without, personality too? With or without glitter on him. Um, glitter is optional. Optional. <laughs> Excuse me, Anatoly. Can we get a sandwich over here? <laughs> Hello. I know. Mm. Awesome. So you guys stick around. She's gonna do a second set in the second half, so stick around. And thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me. Yay, thanks guys. All right, I'm gonna use this one for this. So, hope everybody is feeling kinda hot. Hot summer day. We have an amazing storyteller coming up next for you all that I'm, I'm super excited to have Siobhan O'Loughlin. We're welcoming you back actually to our show. She's one of our favorite multi-threat superwoman artists and she's currently in the midst of a national tour of her second solo show, Natural Novice. Um, where if you, uh, you're in luck if you live in Minneapolis, Seattle, or Chicago and because in the next six weeks, she is coming your way. We are glad she was able to stop here upon her return to the East Coast from the West Coast. Coincidentally, the first part of her tour and her first trip to the West Coast. We're glad you came back. They seem to be getting all of our people. Um, so. She's gonna come up, I'm sure she'll tell you all about it. So you guys give a big warm welcome for Siobhan O'Loughlin. Okay, hi. So, um, hello. So this is kind of, uh, this is gonna be fun. What's that? I, do, I don't need a chair. Um, but so I'm gonna get sort of like sentimental and emotion and like, you know, quaint like that. So that'll be fun with some backup conversation going on. That's my favorite way to do it. Um, so I wanna tell you guys, it's July. So about a year ago, um, a person who I care very much about went missing. He was traveling from uh, New Zealand to Australia and he travels by boat. And um, about three weeks after he left for Australia, his dad actually sent me an email saying that, um, sending me an article about the boat and the six or eight people that were on it and um, that they had been missing for those three weeks. So for the next 10 days, um, we still didn't know, we didn't know until the New Zealand Coast Guard gave up um, and they determined that the boat could not be found. And a year has gone by and um, there still has been nothing. So we have, for the most part, accepted that, um, that he's gone. So um, this year has been a lot for me in terms of dealing with the death of someone who I was in love with, of who meant a lot to me, um, who I looked to um, as a friend, as a guide, as a comfort, as a person who um, took care of me. So um, a lot has sort of happened um, this year, including uh, there's this, uh, this person, um, this friend of mine, um, his name is Bill. And Bill is like a, a, a showmance. And if you're in theater, it's like your, your, theater, your stage romance is also your, your showmance. So it's like you have, a, you have a theater crush that you're working on a theater project with someone, but you like them, and so it's like your showmance. And um, this guy, Bill, we worked on several different projects um, together here in New York City. And um, it was about October of last year. And um, he had written on his Facebook that he was in the hospital. Um, and someone posted, and he was in the hospital, and then he went, he went home, and then he had posted that he was in the hospital again. And someone commented, like, Bill, how long are you going to be in the hospital for? And he responded, I I'm not sure. And so I was like, um, I'm not, I don't know what that means. I don't even know Bill very well, but I'm going go, um, to go and see him. So it's Halloween when I finally get around to visiting him, and I've decided to surprise him. 
And so I'm just wearing my Halloween costume. I was Rosie the Riveter last year because that's just my thing. I was just, that's what I was. And um, so I have my little costume on and I brought him a pumpkin and like a sort of fall bouquet of stuff. And I decided to surprise him, but it turns out this hospital area is like enormous. And I, and I had to sort of go through several different sections. I finally found out where he was. And um, so I kind of get there and they give me his room number and I, and I like make my way and I'm like, oh, and I'm like, you know what? I'm going there before rehearsal. I'm just gonna do this, visit him. Um, and I will do this uh, and we'll probably like take selfies like on his bed and then just like, we'll be, like, be done and then I'll go do the rest of my day. So I, um, I peek in through the door that has his, that it has the number of his room on it. And there's a, a man and a woman sitting together and they're wearing like, looks like those sort of scrubs, I guess, like a, um, something you put on over your clothes in the hospital. Um, and they're sitting and I'm like, hey, is this Bill's room? And they're like, yes. And their face is sort of light up. So it's Bill's father and his aunt. And they're like, well, Bill's sleeping right now, actually. And they point to him. And um, my friend in the hospital bed doesn't look like the person that I know. I mean, he's sleeping and he has a cloth over his eyes, but he's very, very thin. And the Bill that I had this sort of showmance for, well, he was sort of like a chunkier guy who's now um, extremely thin and extremely pale. And he's sleeping in this bed. And I realized then, as I'm like holding this like, pumpkin and this Halloween costume that maybe I've sort of stepped into something that I didn't quite understand and that perhaps like a surprise wasn't really the best. Well, I wasn't really think through this because I actually have no idea why he's in the hospital. And all of a sudden I become very, very aware and I see that he's sleeping and I said, I'm so sorry. I, I've been in a show with him. I'm just, just an acquaintance. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. And then Bill's aunt sort of looks in his direction. She's like, oh, Bill's awake. Look, Bill, Betty Boop came to see you. <laughs> And I, uh, so he, I look at him and I'm like, hey, Bill, um, happy Halloween. I brought you this pumpkin. Bill looks more um, embarrassed than anything else. I guess um, he didn't, ex obviously didn't expect me to be there. And um, his eyes are um, yellow because um, he's very sick. And it's a thing that, of course, I didn't quite understand. But now, like, here I am. And his dad and his aunt are so happy to see me. They're so happy that someone's there. So they're like, Siobhan, sit down. Move this, move the teddy bear and you can sit down. So I, I hold the bear in my lap and I'm like, oh, well, who is this bear, Bill? What's the bear for? And Bill's like, well, the bear's much happier now that you're holding him. But the reason I, I got it is because um, I, uh, the bear is designed, it's sort of like a tough, it's like a sturdy stuffed animal that's sort of designed for you to hold when you're coughing up blood. So this is all very um, overwhelming uh, information. And I'm trying to um, be cool, not to cry, and to act like I'm the most comforting, bright, spirited person ever. And so we just sort of engage in a, in a conversation about what I'm doing and you know what's happening and how to be positive and happy. Um, and uh, so I finally, when I decide to leave, I'm like, OK, I'm going to get out of here and like I'll whatever I'll be fine I, well, I have to go I decide to go and I'm like Bill you know can I um can I touch you can I give you a hug and he says well okay so I go over um to him but I he he can't really um he can't really lift his hands very well and it's um it's very hard to sort of see something so close with a person who is so young like my age like he's like 30 um so I'm like, it's okay, Bill, don't worry about it. And I, and I sort of lean over and I give him like this like tender, gentle, hardly hug. And um, his father stops me and he says, you know, your presence here was really great today. You, you have like this Rosie the Riveter, like we can do it spirit. And that's really what, what we needed. So I leave um, and I'm sort of overwhelmed with emotion and the fact that I feel like I completely fucked up and I didn't do the right thing and I, and I didn't really prepare for what was happening and I, and I shouldn't have worn that I was like in the wrong outfit, I was in the wrong like, like mentality, I like didn't know what I was going into. So I call my mom because I'm, the per I'm that person, I, I just call my mom in these kinds of situations and I'm like, you know, I, I, just, I just wanted to see him because I knew that he was gonna be there for, he said he didn't know when he was gonna get out so I just thought I would visit um, because it made me think of, it made me think of Matt and how I never got to say goodbye. So my mom says, you know, it's really great actually because there's so much that Matt has taught you. And even when he's gone, um, he's allowed you to go and visit Bill 
so that if you needed to say goodbye, you were able to, and maybe you wouldn't have done that without Matt before. And so this is actually a good thing, and, and you should feel okay. So, thank you. back a little. someone you love today. Call someone you love right now. Give your friend a hug. Come on, give the person next to you a hug. Let's spread the love, people. We're only here for such a short oh, period. It's like, yeah, you That's see? So Come nice. on, sweet. <laughs> it's important. Hugs are important, too. We don't give enough hugs. It's true. It's very important. Human touch is very important to people. So, that was really moving. I've heard you do a lot of different stories. Where, when you are, okay, sitting down. Now you have a very busy life. You travel a lot. <laughs> yes. You do a lot of things. Yes. What, where, at what point do you, you're sitting somewhere and you're like, you know what, that's going to be a story. Well, so I'm a, I'm a firm believer in journaling for several different reasons. I think when you journal, then sometimes all those crazy psycho things you want to tell a person, you're able to not tell them because you got it out <laughs> in one way. True. So when you're like obsessed with someone, not that I get obsessed with people, I do. Um, you don't, you don't, you don't tell them all those things. So I try to write a lot, and basically what ha what I do is if I sort of I'll go through one of my little handwritten books, and I'll pick up on something that uh, meant, a lot, meant a lot to me, and maybe that I might that I think is relatable for other people. And then I'll sort of type it out and look at it and see if it's something that I could present that other people would resonate with as well. Yeah. So you do. It. You do resonate with uh, a lot of well, people. Well, thank you. Write you. a book, girl. <laughs> Maybe. We'll see. So can we tell everybody just a little bit about, so for people that might not know about your show, Natural Novice, can you talk a little bit about that? It's a really amazing show. <laughs> yes. Miss Stephanie was in the front row at center. Uh, Didn't yeah. shave you. <laughs> So I am a solo artist, so I do uh, this kind of thing, but just for a, an hour, and make people listen to me talk for an hour. And uh, the natural novice is entirely different from this kind of thing that you just saw. It's, um, it's a play about female body hair, and uh, I tell my personal stories, and I've also interviewed six other women, um, and I perform as the women that I interviewed. So, and it really runs the gamut of different, different women and, and their experiences. There's a transgender woman, there's a Chinese lesbian, there is, um, there's a Jewish sorority girl. There's just a variety of women who have different perspectives and experiences with body hair. And um, it's mostly fun and sort of a, a silly romp about the things we do. But it's also um, an exploration of uh, female aesthetic and how we are defined based on what we look like and um, the importance of our agency and our decisions um, that we make for ourselves over what we do and why that's important. So to that decision when society or people, men, <laughs> try to make us think otherwise. Come on, I'm just going to throw this out there. There's some men out there. You might, may or may not know this, but waxing is really painful. <laughs> Appreciate it, okay, guys? Seriously. So, yeah, but it's a comedy um, because it's so personal. True. It's, it's true. true and comedy true. is funny. It's, you would like it. It's all that kind of stuff. <laughs> You would yeah. like, are you going to Canada? Not yet, but I hope to. We'll talk uh, about maybe, that. Uh, we'll talk about that. Talk for sure. um, so yeah, so I'm going to Minneapolis starting on Saturday uh, for the Minnesota Fringe, and then I'll be in Seattle and Chicago. And That's amazing. It's going to be crazy. Yeah, we just did St. Louis, which is awesome. Sold out run in St. Louis. It was amazing. Um, she was in the paper there, too. There <laughs> Three was times, amazing. four yeah. times. Yeah, it was really awesome. They were, they were very excited in the Midwest, the mighty Midwest. 
So what's their, <laughs> like, when you actually talk to some of these people after your show, like, what's their opinion? Like, is it, like, a regional thing here? I mean, I feel like girls are pretty... I had a really awesome, this guy who writes for Alive magazine, which is a sort of a great pop culture magazine in St. Louis, um, the writer uh, who interviewed me after the performance because he was doing a feature, a feature on me, and he said, um, originally when he had emailed me, and I had emailed him inviting him to come see the show, he said, um, you know what, honestly, female body hair freaks me out, think it's gross, think it's weird, uh, don't get it. Your photos are intense. My photos are like these black and white, like naked shots of me with like armpit hair, and it's like whatever. And he was like, and your photos are like really intense, but they're kind of cool. And I feel like the fact that I don't like it is the reason that I need to come and see your play, which was an awesome. That's really cool. A really cool. I was so like not liking him the way you were describing. No, it. And but then when you said that. But what was great is it was such an honest email, and so then he. Um, so he was great. Our talk afterwards, he was like, there's so much that in my life that I haven't thought about what people go through to please other, someone else. And the, the thoughts that I have had that are unfair towards my partners um, and the, what I've, the standards that I've held them to. And to myself, yeah, and how that, yeah, and how, that does reflect on ourselves, I think, when we ex have a lot of those expectations on our partners. It does sure. also reflect on ourselves. And, the expectations we have of ourselves that we can't really meet or maintain. So um, he was, that was a great, really, he was really um, open-minded and excited and like, I don't know, my, I had a guy who filmed it a couple, like way back in New York and he afterwards, he was like, I learned so much about women. And I was like, yes, there's, yes, there's things yeah. to learn. But yeah, I mean, I also had some young like college girls who don't shave, who like were like total groupies. They were like, ah! This is great, sign our programs. And I was like, wow, this what? is awesome. So yeah, it was really cool. It was very cool. And it was what was really fun about one of the St. Louis shows is my cousin is a roller derby girl out there. So a lot of her friends are like these sort of like uh, tough like dude types who are like carpenters or mechanics, like tattoos, and, like whatever. And there was like, it was an audience like full of like these kinds of guys who were like totally into the show. They were crying, they were laughing, they were like, afterwards they were like, I totally relate to being judged for how I look. And it was just like, it was really great. Oh so, my God, that's amazing. Yeah, it was a cool, it was a cool experience. Well, so. that's a really riveting show. Ah, you, you thank you. Because you encompass like six different characters in one show. Who are very different from and each other. And me, different. different from me, too. And very different from you. Yes. I love it. So we're gonna get deep more into the mind of Siobhan. <laughs> so you know the drill. Um, pick a number, one through 18. So how about mm, 16? That one. How do you keep focused on a goal? Oh. Um, I make lists and cross them out in a, in a book. And I, uh, sometimes I'll I'll have like someone, a writing buddy, come sit with me and like we'll write together and we'll like time, do that's, times. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, and we'll be like, okay, let's check in after like 45 minutes or, you know, that kind of thing. But the truth is, I'm very disorganized and very unfocused. And so right now, I'm completely in over my head with like this tour stuff and I have no idea how it's going to go. So. It's going to go great. <laughs> Focus, what's beyond that? And then just think about the other side. Um, I'm a little chronic list maker myself. I get so much satisfaction like crossing things. I just put things on there that I've already done just so I can like have the satisfaction of like crossing things off. So that's my that's a good way of organizing. All right, pick another number. Um, how about number three? Three. What things did you have to let go of or leave behind in order to take the leap? Uh, okay, so I think the biggest thing that I feel like you have to learn is that there is so much that is out of your control. So, um, because the more, because you, there's so many, cause basically expecting that everything is going to go wrong is what is going to happen. Like, your printer will jam when you need to print six, you know, 50 page scripts, and your laptop will shut down when all of your sound cues are on it, and you will get into a bike accident the day of your show, all of those things are gonna happen. And you can, it really, it's not really about the things that happen to you, but it's just how you deal with them. And so I had to sort of let go of like, the need to, to feel like I was, that I made everything perfect because I made it that way. Well, it's like, I can try to do my best. And even then it's not, it's not gonna be the thing that I'm hoping it will be. 
and further like when those things happen that you just have to say like all right there's nothing i can do about that thing that happened yeah. and i have to sort of shed that fear of it and just and just accept accept right we control nothing <laughs> it's all about our reaction i know that That's there's a yeah. certain person out there who kind of knows <laughs> very well i'm not going to name names going to point to her she's off camera she knows that like i definitely deal like trying to plan out everything and then it all falls yeah. apart so yes controlling your reaction is the only thing you can do one last question are you ready are you sure you're ready <laughs> pick a number one through nine um one through nine? Yes. Okay, how about seven? If you could be a sound, what would it be? <laughs> These are really thought provoking. I think, I, I think I've done this one before, actually. Do you want to Let's do have? a different. Yeah, I think I did that one. Let's do number six. She did number six, but you. Okay, let's do number five. <laughs> um, what was the last new band that you discovered or saw live? Uh, the last band that I saw live I guess it's been have I been to concerts in forever what are some of the things you do on the road Tegan and Sarah oh, that's <laughs> like a year ago or more but they were great everyone should go nice. that was awesome Tegan yes. and Sarah like recommend right there Canadians they are Canadians right <laughs> that's being twins we should find out about their body hair we should I will tweet at them. They tweet will definitely respond. <laughs> they totally might. Awesome. So she's going to do another story for us. So you're already Right here. now? Right now. Okay, you great. Do yep. I think now's a good time. Okay. All right. Okay, great. So I'm going to continue with that. So uh, part of the thing about Matt and what was so difficult was that we had sort of had this like uh, romantic thing, but he was a world traveler. He's English. And um, he was sort of uh, exploring all over the place. And he was doing it sustainably, so he was traveling by boat. Um, and part of what was hard for me about losing him was that I had never been especially honest about my feelings. I mean, I was in a way, but never like, never in a way that was particularly brave or courageous or upfront. And I think that's sort of an issue that I have always had. Um, now, uh, so, he, so he was lost in the Pacific Ocean, which is an enormous body of water. And being an East Coast person, I had never even seen that body of water, even though I've traveled to like West Africa and you know Europe and whatever um, South America. But I had never, um, I never been anywhere that connected to the Pacific Ocean until this summer. My godmother, who is a union organizer, she's an amazing person, and she really commits to being an activist and making the world a better place. And um, she, uh, so she's a union organizer. She lives in a different city every year. And so this year, she has been in San Francisco. She's been there since like March. And so she was like, Siobhan, when are you going to come to San Francisco to see me? And I was like, oh, I don't know, because like, I'm a nanny here, and it's super busy in my job and my life. And so finally, we sort of scraped together the time and the situation where I could go and spend almost a week um, in California. And so the first thing that she did when we arrived, which is something that an East Coast person would do, is um, go to the ocean. Because you're like, here is the other side of the country. La la. And so um, uh, for me, it was really uh, interesting to see this body of water because I know that it's where Matt died. And um, so I didn't, you're supposed to like dip your toes in. First of all, thing I didn't know about San Francisco is that it's cold. I thought everywhere in California was Daisy Dukes and bikinis on top. So I was like, oh, it's cold and I am a person who gets really cold really easily. So I was like quite bundled kind of clutching my sweater and I was also wearing tights and like boots and my, and Lynn, she's like, do you want to dip your toes in the water? I was like, First of all, it's cold, I'm good. Second of all, I really just didn't want to um, because of the way that I perceive the ocean. Um, and then I sort of was talking to her and I, was, and I said, you know, how long do you think it takes for a body to decompose? Or do you think that maybe his skeleton is still there? And she's like, you know what, Siobhan, I think you're done. We're done with, <laughs> just stop. Just, you need to take a break. And I was like, okay, I know, I know. It's just that it's this thing that when you think about it every day, you think about all the aspects of losing that person every day, especially when you, this person is young and they were sort of taken from you suddenly and without, um, and without even, and without really any conclusion because when a body is not found, and this is a thing I didn't, I didn't understand before, but when a body has never been found, it's like this whole other, this whole other thing of dealing with death and conclusion that is really hard. 
So anyway, um, I spent a lot of time wandering around by myself, and for anybody else who travels alone a lot, where you just kind of walk around, you'll notice sometimes that you're just like, you've been wandering all day, and like, you're like, wow, I haven't said a word to anyone, like, all day, this is like, and then you're like, it feels really weird. So um, I, was, I was walking down the, um, I was in the Mission, which is like, I don't know, has anybody been to San Francisco? So the Mission is supposed to be like Brooklyn, that's like their Brooklyn. Okay, so as I was like, la la, walking, after having some vegan Japanese stuff, I, um, I saw this poet sitting on a um, corner, uh, and he has dark skin and a fro, a big afro, and um, square framed glasses, and he's sitting at a table with a typewriter and a sign that says, you pick the subject and the price. And the thing is, I had just seen him earlier that day in Haight-Ashbury in a different area, and he was doing the same thing, and I walked by him thinking, like, that's kind of cool. But then I saw him again as I was walking, and I was like, oh my god, I have to talk to him. So I was like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do the thing. And he was like, okay. And I was like, I, uh, is $5 okay? And he has like this sort of like poker face expression. He's like, it's, it's, it's your choice. And I was like, great. So $5, but like, what should my, what should my subject be? And he's like, it's your choice. And I was like, right, but I just don't know. I've never had anyone, like, I've never commissioned anyone to write a poem for me before. And there's so many things and feelings that I have. I don't know what I want you to say. And so while I'm sort of, like, talking excitedly and the guy is sort of, like, you know, straight face looking at me, um, another dude, a sort of olive-skinned man with a beard and a blue track jacket on a bicycle kind of, like, parks beside us. And he's, like, genuinely interested. And his name is Bernard. He's from Barcelona. And so he's like really into like, wow, I think this, this typewriter poem thing is really cool. Like, what are you guys doing? And I was like, well, he's going to write me a poem. And uh, the, the Barcelonian bicyclist is like, well, what, what are you going to write about? And I was like, I just don't know. And he was like, well, what about love? And I said, you know, that's not really my subject. And they're like, well, what do you mean that's not your subject? And I was like, that's not really my thing. You see, I have a lot of pride. And because of my pride, that means I don't really talk to, I don't ever really confront people with my feelings because I, the thought of like the rejection is just something that like my ego can't handle. So I will never like risk, I'll never put myself on the line because I'm, I just won't, I just refuse to be taken down. And uh, the poet looks up at me from his square framed glasses and his dark, dark eyes. And he says, that's not pride. That's fear. And I was sort of shocked to hear this because I'm certainly no coward. And I, and I said, well, that isn't, that just isn't true. And I turned to the, the, the Spanish cyclist and I'm like, right? He's not right. And the Spanish cyclist sort of gives me this very empathetic, like raises his eyebrows and sort of like sweetly smiles and shrugs his shoulders and says, yeah, it is. And so I looked, at the, I looked at the cyclist, and I looked at the poet, and the cyclist and the poet, I looked at them, looked at them, and I was like, okay, 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 fine, 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 let's just, write the, let's just write the poem about the feelings. Let's just do it. Let's do the feelings. So we typed on the typewriter, and the, and the biker is proud of me. And then I, so we, he, he finishes it, and I'm like, and I give it to the biker, and I'm like, here, you should read it. But read it quietly in your mind. Like, don't read it out loud, but read it in your mind, but also keep it quiet in your mind. He's like, okay, you're kind of a weird girl. So he reads the, he reads the thing. <laughs> He reads the thing, and then he gives it back to me. And I take it, um, and I didn't really like the poem. <laughs> I didn't really, the poem didn't really nail exactly where I felt like I was at, but I liked the poet, and I liked the biker, and I sort of liked this sort of extremely humbling experience after I had spent the day um, in San Francisco, and I walked across the, um, the bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge. Has anybody else walked across that bridge? So I was really interested in the bridge because earlier this year I signed a petition um, uh, to get the barrier, to get better barriers on that bridge, because um, a woman's teenage son had just thrown himself off, and I looked it up, and it found that actually that's the second highest suicide bridge um, in the world, with 46 uh, suicides in 2013 off that bridge, um, and the highest one is the Yangtze Bridge in China, that has have over 2,000 people have jumped off that bridge to the point where some people have made it like their goal, their objective, like retired older people in China have made it their point of occupation to hang out on that bridge and talk to people that they think are about to jump. Crazy, right? Really crazy. So I was really curious for that bridge for multiple reasons. And um, I, was, I was walking across and the, the side, the gates, the border, the barrier, whatever you want to call it, 
they are shorter than me. I'm a short person. I'm wearing heels, but I'm actually under five foot. And those those walls are shorter than me, so I could very easily climb that and, and go over if I wanted to. So it was a really weird it was a really weird experience. And so I looked down at the water at the bay, and I looked out at all the sort of, you know, pastel colored houses that people live in and their box like bungalows and it's just like this like a beautiful view of California and when you look at these views and you think of people jumping it's like this really strange sentiment and then I look at the water and I think about and I think about death and water and life and my fears and my fears that the poet sort of like aligned for me it's true I like to sort of think of myself as having all this bravery and this courage but in fact it is my own insecurities and so back at the ocean um, there with my godmother I'm sort of looking at the water and really missing Matt um, and I think what I've kind of determined through all of this is that um, I have to think of the Pacific Ocean um, as part of my friend so my friend is the Pacific, and the Pacific is my friend. Because he is, um, he's in that water in some, in some way. And so for me, sort of like resonating with that or accepting that and just standing at the water and feeling like maybe every time that I happen to be in a part of the world that borders this body of water, it's just me visiting my friend. Because he has no grave, right? He has no, his body isn't anywhere. And um, it's been a year, but a year is like this, um, it's a short time and also a long time when you're dealing with something that is new to you. It's the first time I've lost anyone who really mattered to me, and especially someone that I had feelings for. And so I stood at the water and I watched it and I was afraid to touch it, so I didn't. And I looked out and I walked away. And as I turned my back, I just sort of looked over at the ocean and I just said, bye Matt. And the waves, it just kept on rolling. Thank you. Cool, yummy. Love it. Sorry. We're fine, we got it. You should get a reaction, though. You touched on something in your story when you were. Well, it wasn't really specifically about your friend, but you talked about how you walk around, like you had to talk to anybody. That kind of sounds peaceful to me, because as a singer, I have days where I don't speak at all. And sometimes when I'm like on vocal rest, I think to myself, I mean, what kind of a man wants to be with a woman that can't talk? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> also, I wanted to mention for every <laughs> Nobody said anything, so clearly. Um, if anybody in the interworld has questions for Siobhan or Shirley, you can get them to us and we can ask them for you. I should have said that when I was sitting down. Um, another really quick thing I wanted to mention uh, on my card. Yeah, that's it. Is I recently got a really amazing opportunity to be on a tribute album for an artist named Shirley Collins. So not only is it a Shirley day, it's a triple S threat day here at Miss Stephanie's house. Um, but a little brief background about Shirley Collins. She is England's first lady of folk. And um, she was, whatever the equivalent is being knighted by the queen, she has that for a woman. And um, in the 50s, she traveled around the US with Alan Lomax, if any of you guys are like folk fans and have heard of him. He came over here, they did a road trip through the South with like the first known recording equipment. And we went into like churches and went into these places in the Deep South um, and recorded some of these people. They actually discovered Mississippi Fred McDowell on that trip um, and tons of other great American bluesmen and women. So um, Shirley was on the road with him. She's a singer-songwriter herself, um, originally from England. Alan is from the US. Um, when she went back, she was opening for Jimi Hendrix and like one of the leading females in the folk movement in England. Um, so there is a Kickstarter that is going on. They are doing a documentary about her life. It is called The Ballad of Shirley Collins. And um, they're doing a tribute album, so people like Jeff Tweedy from Wilco is going to be on there, and Colin Malloy from The Decemberist is going to be on there. And um, if I get my track done, I'm going to be on there too. So yeah, Shirley Collins, look her up. The Kickstarter is there. And if you guys are, you know, want more information, you can email us, um, or you can look it up and donate some money. It's going to be a really um, 
a really great documentary, I think, because she was a very pivotal part of the folk movement in England. I should have done that before I announced all that. All right. Um, <laughs> anyway, we are going to let Miss Shirley Noam come on back up to the stage and uh, do another set for you guys. Let's give another round of applause for Siobhan and her story, please, because that was wonderful. I, uh, I am an emotionalist cunt, so that was a nice transition. Um, <laughs> in contrast. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I like to uh, be a, a total scrote and avoid my feelings quite a bit. Um, let me tell you. <laughs> and uh, in fact, because I've had, you know, uh, you know, I've had my heart broken, I've had some shitty things happen, as we all have, so I found a loophole now, because I still like having sex, but I don't like any of that emotional, icky stuff. So I just started having sex with my friend. And, uh, yes, you're, nobody responds to that, because that's awkward. <laughs> uh, I hear from a lot of people that say that you cannot have sex with a friend without it getting awkward and complicated, like one person... Male or female friend? Oh, it's a male friend. But thank you for not assuming. <laughs> um, it's a male friend. And, um, and, and uh, as things go between two friends that are heterosexual, you think that that might get weird. But I wrote this whole song to prove that I'm not in denial about it. And it's called Just Friends, because we're just friends. It's totally not weird. Twins are triplets. Can you guys hear my guitar? start pressing random buttons and see if we get that weird whale noise to come back. <laughs> Don't touch it. Thank you. Got it. Your sound got Yay! All right, now go back to texting. That's what sound men do. And then they do sound in between. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Yeah. Anyway, like I was saying, just friends, totally not weird. Everything's cool. We have sex. It's not weird. Okay. We've been friends for oh so long We're so close, it's real nice When people say that there's something there A spark between us trying to start a flame I'm telling you there's no fire Cause I go to bed feeling moist and wet How could a fire ever start In such an inhospitable environment? Just because you're a man that turns me on doesn't mean I need you You're a man who stares at me Right in my ass like a good friend would You send me messages late at night To tell me how good of friends we are I agree and I touch myself Damn, we're such good friends, yeah We can't let this penis come between us Literally or figuratively Well, I know what people try to tell us But heterosexual romance is gay I won't say what I just can't say I'm not afraid, I just like to get laid And no matter how this starts or ends I love you, baby, but we're just friends Then one night we got drunk I showed you a video You showed me your junk What a nice friend A friend of mine I showed you my vag Cause I'm polite and kind Then we hugged And it felt so good It felt like friendship Like friendship should Went to bed And spooned and led To fork and yell We forked in bed We can't let this be come between us except sometimes in a sexual way we go out and you get hit on but I'm not jealous I just like punching people in the face so no matter how this starts or ends I love you baby but we are just friends so 
So we pooled our money and bought a house together just cause buying property that way it's more economical. <laughs> the twin beds, well they cost so much, but your mom bought us a king size, plenty of room for friends. And Sherry, I'm not in denial, I know that I'm pregnant, could you please stop pointing? Two friends, they can have kids, it doesn't have to be all weird, no. We may have let this penis come between us To be specific, we let it come inside my giant baby Making uterus Accidental pregnancy is totally gay So no matter how this starts or ends I love you baby, but we're just Now we had some more kids, but the reason you see is that you don't have to pay them to cook and clean. They don't laugh, they don't even smile, they say they're sick of us being in fucking denial. Well, fuck you kids, cause mom and dad, we love each other, but it's not like that. Your dad is just the smartest, hottest, greatest friend I have. Kids are wrong. This isn't getting serious. They sure know how to ruin a family vacation. So no matter how this starts or ends, I'll fuck you, baby, but we're just we're just friends. Thank you. Everything's fine, right? Everything is not weird. But I like to change that now with two 30 second songs about me getting my period. I hope people are still eating. When the blood comes out, the tampon goes in. When the blood comes out, the tampon goes in. When the blood comes out, the tampon goes in. And to answer your question, it doesn't feel good. Mm. I don't get turned on putting in a tampon. I don't get turned on putting in a tampon. I don't get turned on putting in a tampon. I don't feel good at all. Ride round that cat pony. Ride round that cat pony. Ride round that cat pony. Never feel good at all. Okay, that's the first song. <laughs> And this one is a bit more of a, a cautionary tale. Baby, you make me laugh so hard. I laugh so hard it made my tampon come right out. It fell down my leg and it rolled under the table, I guess. This is a Thanksgiving we'll never forget. Yeah, so there you go. I hope I made things weird again. Let's keep it weird. Um, so some songs just come to me in a dream sometimes, and this one is the best example I could possibly have for that. You're just somebody I know, but not really. You're a friend of a friend, and I guess you're all right. I can honestly say I don't find you attractive, but you were inside of my dream last night. In the magical sleep time, you took all your clothes off. I was super turned on, but I wasn't awake. While I was sleeping, the images creeping around in my brain. Well, they're hard to explain. Horrible sex dream, a sex dream about you. Woke up in a cold sweat, I tried to forget. Horrible sex dream, worst thing I've ever seen. I gotta let it, I, I gotta let it go. Your ass inflated, you got down on all fours. You wiggled your bum and yelled, climb aboard. I got on top of you and rode you around. 
And then we fucked, you made walrus sound. Why did we do it on the Teletubby set? That's so goddamn inappropriate. When you came, you yelled, you and I are one. <laughs> and then spiders came tumbling out of your dick. Horrible sex dream, sex dream about you. Woke up in a cold sweat, I tried to forget. Horrible sex dream, worst thing I've ever seen. I gotta let it go, I gotta let it go. The next time I saw you, we were at a party. You said hello, I just screamed and ran off. I know it's irrational and kind of insane, but when I see you, I see spiders coming at your penis again and again and again and again and again. Horrible sex dream, sex dream about you. I shouldn't have blamed you for the things in my brain. There's a horrible sex dream, it doesn't mean anything. You're not to blame for my sleepy time shame. I'm not to blame for my sleepy time shame. No one's to blame for my sleepy time shame except for maybe HBO and the cheese that I ate. <laughs> Bad dream. <laughs> All right, I got one last song coming up now, and uh, I'm gonna get Miss Stephanie to join me for this. Um, I heard she was an exceptional singer, so I gave her a kazoo. <laughs> it was one of her favorite instruments as a child, though, so we figured this will be good uh, to get back to the roots, and uh, you're gonna have to see her sing something that has more um, artistic merit at another time and place. <laughs> yes, perhaps the Shirley Collins album would be a better example of your technique as a vocalist, but today, the kazoo. The kazoo is a pretty hot instrument right now, you know, uh, sort of in a hipstery way. And that's why I thought it would be appropriate for this song about a very special hipster that I know. A lot of people have mixed feelings about hipsters, and I was one of those people until I discovered that I had a hipster friend without even knowing about it. It's crazy. So this is a song about that hipster. I got a hot new trend hiding in my pants. A sleek and indie treasure you might know about perchance But I wouldn't be surprised if you don't know what I mean It's only really known in the underground scene Have you heard about my hipster vagina? Hip between my hips but it's not easy to find out Because for a vagina it's pretty obscure So you might not have yet even heard of it at all. Well, it loves tight pants, but not the sensation. Leaves nothing but a camel toe to the imagination. It thinks that mainstream porn is really kind of weird. I guess that would explain the bushy hipster beard. <laughs> loves the feeling of the seat of a retro fixie bike. No brakes and lots of bumpy roads, that's what it really likes. It also gets creative like the paintings done in France. It makes abstract art in my underpants. Have you heard about my hipster vagina? So cool it has two labias, a major and a minor. <laughs> you might not have yet got to see it in its prime. It's known in smaller crowds, but it gets bigger all the time. All right, take it now. Judgmental every day. It can be elitist if you rub it the wrong way. It pretends it doesn't care, but that's not true at all. Cause the ones who say they don't give a fuck give the most fucks of them all. So now you know about my hipster vagina. Pretty obscure, but go and sit in tower. Cause pretty soon you'll see just how popular it will be. 
And everyone will want this vagina when it goes mainstream. You.